Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. We'll, we'll read our passage in a moment, uh, but first, a few introductory thoughts. But before we do any of that, let's um, ask the Lord to bless, bless us through his word and strengthen us. Dear God in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you that the, the weather is beautiful today um, and that we get to come here um, in freedom and worship you and praise you and, and learn um, from you and of you. We pray that our faith would be deepened and strengthened even from the very beginning of this story of Abraham here this morning. We pray this all in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, talk a few big words. You guys like big words. I don't like big words because as soon as, as soon as the word gets longer than three consonants, my eyes start freaking out, and then the vowels all start to mesh together. But let's talk some big words. These are words you've never heard before. Just kidding. Maybe. Um, um, first word is omnipotent. Omnipotent. Have you heard that word before? Omnipotent. Of course, maybe some of you have. This is old news to some of you. But that, that is a theological term. Omnipotence refers to God's omni-all-potency power omnipotence. God is all powerful. But we should, we should, we should define that carefully. Uh, God can do all that he wants, but theologically God is omnipotent to do all that he wants according to his will. That is God's omnipotence. Here's another big word, omniscience. We talked about this last week. Omniscience. Omni, once again, that word for all, and then um, niscience is, is a word referring to knowledge. God has all knowledge about all things. Future knowledge, past knowledge, present knowledge. God knows everything. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows what you're going to think tomorrow before you even think it. That is God's omniscience. But here's another word that we were kind of hinting at last week, but I never actually told you what it was. Um, this is a word... If you knew the other ones, you might not know this one. Omnisapient. Omnisapient. That refers to God's uh, sapience. Uh, the, it's a word that refers to uh, knowledge, or sorry, wisdom, skill. And biblically it refers to, did I say it wrong? No. Okay, you're smiling at me. So between you and Jackson, you guys always tell me with your faces if I said something wrong. Uh, um, that refers to his ability, his 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 skill, his wisdom. And, and then they put that other little part of the word on there, omni. God has all wisdom. That's what we talked about last week. God's wisdom. And, and, and biblically, what we're talking about, when we're talking about God's omnisapience, we're, we're stating that God knows the best and the highest goals for humanity and for his creation. God knows what is best. That is wisdom. It's not wisdom to just know options, but it's wisdom to say, of all of the options, this is the best and the highest one. God knows the best, and also that, that biblical idea of wisdom isn't just knowledge, it's also skill, it's also ability. God no, not only knows the best option, the best goals to pursue for creation and for you individually, he also has skill and ability to bring those things to pass. And then connect all those words, right? God knows all things, and God has all power. So, and then God has all wisdom. God has not only the, the ability to know all of the best options for your life, but he has the wisdom to pick the best one. And God also has not only the wisdom, but also the power to bring that to pass. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about God's wisdom. We're talking about his knowledge of what's best for your life and his ability to bring it to pass. That is God's wisdom. We're beginning this study of God and, and his, his wise, sanctifying work in the believer's life. And what do I mean by sanctifying? That means bringing us and growing us and maturing us into the image of Christ. God has the perfect end goal in mind for your life, that you be conformed to Christ. And he has the power and ability in providence, and strength, and sovereignty to work out all things for your better, for your maturing, for your strengthening, for your growth. Today I just want to look at um, 
look at the way in which our God works, and, and we'll begin to see a little bit of his wisdom. But it might take a little bit of time for us to really connect the dots between our topic, his wisdom, and our passage today. But I just want to look at the way our God works. It's a, it's a, simple, it's a simple outline. We're just going to walk through the beginning years of the life of Abram, soon to be Abraham, and, and just look at the way our God works. Whenever I'm in the Old Testament narrative, what I always want to keep in mind is I, I want to be looking at what God is doing. Because people may have different circumstances, but our God is the same. So when we look at God, even in the Old Testament, we see the same God that we have today and that we serve today. So let's look at the way God works. We're going we're gonna to look and see that he prefers painful places or painful points. He picks unlikely people. He pulls with persistence and he, he, he plunders idle temp- temples and he pursues his purposes. So I'll, I'll break those down really quick, and, uh, or I'll break those down in a long, long message here. Uh, that's what I meant to say. But let's, let's just introduce our text first. You're in Genesis 27, or Genesis 11, 27. See, I just look at that number and then that confuses me, I guess. Uh, Genesis eleven twenty seven. this is the beginning of the life of Abraham. And it goes like this in verse 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. And Haran died in the presence of Terah, his father, in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves, and the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to go to the land of Canaan. And they came as far as Haran and settled there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, you'll probably notice something. Number one, this family tree is messed up. (laughs) Number two, we're just kind of dropping into the middle of Genesis here. And and if if we just jump into the story of Abram, maybe you will kind of forget the big picture. So just real quick, what is Genesis about? Why is Genesis written? Just real, real briefly. Moses is writing this book, this book of Genesis, and he's writing it to the children of Israel as they are standing on the plains of Moab, ready to go into the promised land. So on Thursday night, we're in Joshua. We're talking about the Israelites going into the promised land. And and this is the sermon. This is the five book sermon that Moses preaches to the children of Israel before they enter the land. It's very important that they, they know these truths that are in this book in order for them to know how they are to function as God's people and God's land. And, and the book of Genesis, the, the key word you could say is beginnings or origins. Genesis, it's really fun tells the origin or the beginnings of everything. Genesis tells you, how did all this get here? Why are we here like this? Genesis explains everything to you that you need to know. Do you want to know about where the universe came from? Genesis 1 tells you that. Do you want to know where humanity came from? Genesis 2 tells you that. Do you want to know where sin and depravity and all the wrong and all the problems that we see in our world today? Genesis 3 tells you that. Do you want to know where marriage came from? Genesis 2 tells you that. Do you want to know where the nations came from and how people are scattered the way they are? Genesis 10 tells you that. Do you want to know uh, why there are languages in the world? Genesis 11 tells you that. And do you want to know why there is one nation, Israel, that's still around even today? Genesis 12 tells you that. It tells you the big picture of the world and how it came to be. Now, real quick, I I have this kind of structure on this board here, and this kind of just breaks down the 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 whole book of Genesis. Now, you probably don't want to know this. You could look in John MacArthur's uh, commentary and see this exact same breakdown. So this is nothing new here. But uh, just so you know, Genesis one through eleven gives you the primeval uh, history of the world. So. Yeah, if you can see that. And then Genesis 12 through 50 gives you a patriarch, uh, patriarchal history. Uh, I'll just kind of highlight that so you can kind of see it better. 
And I would suggest to you there's a reason why both of these sections are in the book of Genesis. Uh, First off, uh, 1 through 11 is giving you all of this groundwork to answer one simple question. The, The real question that Moses wants you to ask by the time you're done reading Genesis 1 through 11 is this. Why did God call Abram? Why did God call Abram from Haran? Why did God do this? Why did God call him and not somebody else? Why did God call Abram at all? Why didn't he just call everybody? Why did he just call Abram? So that all of Genesis 1 through 11 is just setting up that question. When you get to Genesis 12 verse 1, God is calling Abraham, and you should all be asking the question, why is God doing this? Well, read Genesis 1 through 11 and you'll know why. But what, why is Genesis 12 through 50 here? Well, this answers another important question. Why is Israel in Egypt? When you get to Exodus 1, Israel's in the middle of bondage in Egypt, and you should be asking a question, how did they get here? Why are they here? Did I spell it wrong? No, I didn't. (laughs) Yeah, thank you very much for that. Israel. Israel. There you go. That's why I don't write on the board. But I I think it's kind of cool to write on the board. It makes me feel cool. Um, this 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 is the big picture of Genesis and what it's trying to do. And it's just answering those simple questions. Do a little thing next time you read through Genesis. Ask these questions and see what kind of answers you get. It's very interesting. It helps you understand a few things. And I'll try to help you um, kind of understand that a little bit as well. And Genesis actually unfolds through this thing called a Toledot structure. Or you can see the word in English, and that's much more helpful to you. Uh, Generations. These are the generations. You see that word all the time through Genesis. And all that's happening there is, is the narrator, Moses is kind of narrowing in on the line that is carrying the promises of God. And as Genesis advances the story, uh, the narrator kind of zooms in and zooms in closer. And then everything else is kind of forgotten about. Um, Have you ever seen those, like, pieces of art that people do? It's called a infinite zoom picture. Anybody see those? No? no, nobody. So, so, so you start out and you're, you're overlooking a beautiful farm and then somebody on their phone just zooms in a little bit and then you zoom in on the house and then you notice inside the house there's a family eating their supper and you zoom into that and you see inside of that room there's a TV and then you zoom into that and then inside that TV is a world. It's a, it's a space opera actually and then you zoom into that and you realize you're in space all of a sudden and then you zoom into that and then you see there's something going on in the astronaut's helmet and then you zoom into the helmet and then suddenly you're in Taiwan and then you zoom and zoom and it just keeps going forever. I watched one just this morning. I was watching for five minutes just zooming in. Forever, eternally. It's an eternal zoom. It's a very fascinating thing. But I kind of feel like that's what Genesis is doing. It is zooming in. It goes from the biggest, broadest picture of the universe being created to one man. And it slowly zooms in. And as you zoom in on that one man, you kind of forget about other things. And you're in a whole other place. And, and once again, the, the, the author, Moses, is trying to say, who is God going to call to fulfill God's purposes, God's plan? So that's kind of Genesis in the big picture. Let's just kind of say, okay, here we are in Genesis 11. God has finally zoomed in. He's gone all the way through the line of Adam, and then he's picked up on the line of Noah, and then he's picked up in in Genesis 10 on the line of Shem. And now here he is in the line of Shem with the generations of Terah. And eventually he'll zoom into one of Terah's sons, Abram. So you see how it zooms in just like that. But let's ask some questions. What is this passage teaching us about the way God works? Well, the first thing I would say it's teaching you is that the painful points he prefers. The, the, the painful parts of life, it almost seems as though God himself prefers to work in and through. 
Well, that's not a message maybe you want to hear, to hear that your God seems to prefer pain in our lives, but that's just the picture that we see in the Bible again and again, and especially in this in this story of Abraham and his family. C.S. Lewis has this quote. He says this, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts in our pain. Pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God seems to prefer pain because pain enables God to speak and for creation to listen. God seems to prefer pain. Now, I say all this to say, if you were reading Genesis eleven twenty seven with me a few minutes ago, and, and it, maybe you perhaps noticed all of the pain that Abram's family went through. Now, first off, there, there, was, there was a little bit of hopeful expectancy in the beginning. You, you notice, first off, Terah, uh, Terah has a son, Haran, and it, it seems to be he seems to be doing very well. Matter of fact, if you can follow it, he has three kids very early on in his life, too, as well. Matter of fact, this, this man, Haran, is named after a, a, a certain god from Ur, um, a god that is kind of, kind of placed beside or, or identified with the moon. It was the moon god, and that was the name of that god was Haran, and this was a god in Ur. As a matter of fact, Ur was a major center of moon worship. They had a massive, a massive temple to this god in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is, which is where Abram originally was. This was called a ziggurat, and that's something that probably the Tower of Babel was as well, a massive tower reaching to the heavens, and this was to worship the god of the moon, Haran. And Haran was named after this god, and, and Haran seems to be uh, apparently very blessed. He has three kids. He has Lot, he has Milka, a girl, and then he has Iska, another girl. Now, to, to our 21st century uh, lens, this is what you're going to say when I break down this uh, family tree. Ew. All right, so let, let's just do this really quick. I, uh, I prepared for this. I prepared for this, and I've always wanted to do that. Whoa, look at that. Um, let's see. Now, here is the, the family tree of Abram. So nah- Nahor is Terah's dad, so we'll just draw an arrow there. And then Terah had a number of kids. I'll leave it at that. And what we see first, we see he had Nahor, or he had Abram, Haran, and Nahor. And then we also read in your very passage that Haran had three kids. He had a girl, Iska. It's not Isaac. See, where were you? Where were you? Somebody said you misspelled Isaac, and I was like, ah, actually wrong. I was paying attention when I wrote that. All right, he had Iska, he had, this is where it gets weird, Milka, and then he had the one that you probably know the most, Lot. And here's what happened. Uh, Haran had Iska, Lot, and Milka, and then Milka marries Nahor. See that? Her uncle. So, what's going on here? This is weird. And then it gets even worse. Well, maybe not worse. It, once again, this was normal in those days. Matter of fact, the, the law of God, uh, eventually in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you see it kind of forbade things like this. But, but init- uh, originally, this was kind of normal. But we also find something else. Later in Genesis, we discover that Sarai is Terah's daughter. But not through the same woman that had Abram. Because he says, oh, she was my sister, just not just the, the, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. So what is that? Concubine? I'm not sure. But anyway, Sarah married Abram. So there's the beautiful family tree. <laughs> Do you know what I see when I see this family tree? Problems. But that's the Bible in family tree world. Uh, so... Here, here we have, here we have, but we, we have an expectant, uh, a hopeful start. Because notice, Haran here has three kids right out of the gates. It seems as though the gods are blessing the, the household of Terah, it would seem. And, and perhaps they have moved to Ur to worship this god, Haran. 
And maybe that's why the name Haran is the same name that is given to the sun. Because they worship the, the god Haran. And they want to uh, signify their worship for this god by naming their son after the moon god Haran. So initially, it seems as though everything's happy in the household of Haran, but then the pain and the problems begin. Well, number one, I mean, Haran didn't start having kids until he was 70. And if you even contrast the, the genealogies before this in chapter 11, everybody's having kids at 35, 30, 29, 30, 30. And so. so there's already a sense that, man, Tara, Tara's having trouble having kids. And maybe that's why Sarah was through a concubine, because he was having so much trouble. He didn't have Abram and Nahor and Haran until he was seven. That's just a little side thought. But, but notice, notice. As soon as he has kids, the the problems don't go away. Uh, Right when things seem to be turning around, he has kids finally at the age of 70, smack his young son, Haran, who just had three kids, dies. Look at verse 28. He dies. And notice notice the, the picture here of this family and their pain. This son, Haran, dies in the presence of his father been to a few funerals in my life. You know what the worst ones are? The one where the parent or the dad is going to the funeral of his son. Nothing worse than that. Nothing worse than a funeral like that. I have never seen my grandpa cry until he was at the funeral of my uncle. And he never was the same after that. Matter of fact, he died a few years later. And I never have seen my dad cry like the way he cried when my brother died. There is something wrong about a son dying before his father. And there's great grief in that. And notice the, the, the author in verse 28 kind of pulls that out. He died in the presence of his father. There is grief and pain in this family already. And then this grieving family, we learn, leaves their home. They return, perhaps, to their ancestral home up north in a town called Haran. And here's where it gets dicey. But I swear, Haran and Haran are different people. There's Haran the place, and then there's Haran the person. You can tell them because it's, one of them is a rough breather. So Haran the place is Haran, and Haran the person is Haran. Did you hear that? Did you hear the difference? Very obvious, very obvious. Native speakers, maybe, perhaps. Uh, So we have a grieving family leaving their home and returning to maybe their ancestral home. And notice, once again, uh, God seems to move this family according to his purpose. How? Through pain. Pain is how God sometimes moves and speaks to us. And then on top of all of this, verse 30 tells us that Sarai is barren herself. This is a family that has pain. And God seems to be pleased to work in this family. This is the kind of family that God calls to be the funnel of his grace to the world. A a family with pain. A family living under the curse and the ache of the curse. And I would even say this is not necessarily a unique family problem. This is just the family that the author Moses decided to zoom in on. Every family lives under the curse of, of sin. We're just zooming in on this one. Let's look at another way God works. Another way God works. He, not, only, not only do we see that uh, the painful parts he prefers, but also, think about this, the unlikely people he picks. God seems to be pleased to use people that have the most going against them and who have the most impossible circumstances to overcome. And it's not just that Abe had a, a long way to go to be useful to God. Uh, Abe has an impossible uh, um, obstacle in his way. His wife is barren. He's, he's not somebody you would pick to build a nation through. If you were picking a Frisbee team, he would be that last guy that's there. And you're like, well, you can have him. I'll give you, I'll give you that player. Just, you know, you can even have more players than me. That's that's who Abram is. Actually, I think the author 
kind of demonstrates this a little bit. If you, if you jump over to, don't, you don't have to do that, but if you, if you look at Genesis 22, you actually notice that Nahor, Abram's brother, actually is very fruitful. Uh, and Nahor has eight kids through Milcah. Remember this? He, uh, she has eight kids. And then he has another concubine, and he has four more kids, adding up to 12 kids. And it seems as though Nahor and Abram are like in contrast to each other. N- uh, Abram can't have one kid. Nahor can have tons of kids. And this is actually the kind of person that God calls. Acts 7 actually tells us that God called Abram out of Ur before his family even moved north to Haran, back when Abram had no kids as well. And not only uh, was Abram near impossible in his age, God seems to call him in a painful situation as well, right? When his family's in pain, God calls him to leave his house and his relatives. And now why does God pick people like this? Why does God seem to like unlikely people? Well, it tells, uh, we learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, that, that Paul says, Lord, why are you giving me these, this thorn in the flesh, which is probably a false teacher. And the Lord responds, says, I'm not going to remove this difficulty from your life. I'm rather going to just give you more grace. And then Paul, of course, responds and says, I am content with my weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions and hardships for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then he is strong. Here it is. Why does God pick the unlikely, impossible people? Because God wants people that he can show his great strength and grace through. Are you someone that has lots to offer to God? He might not have any use for you. He wants people that can show off his grace and his strength. He chooses people who are sinful and know they are sinful who are weak before him and know they are weak before him, who confess their sins to him because they know they have nothing to offer to him. Those are the kinds of people that God picks because he is in the business of showing off his strength. Let's look at another uh, part of our outline, the way God works, Uh, the persistence of his pull, the persistence of his pull. God is, God keeps going after the people that he has called. And even when they are slow to obey and to come to him, he is persistent in his poll. God will get the people he picks, and his sovereign poll cannot be escaped. Now, there are a few uncomfortable uh, uh, chronological issues in our passage, and let's just talk about them right now. First off is, is Terah's age when Abe leaves home in Genesis twelve four. It appears that he is... He is simply 145 years old because he had Abram at 70 years old. And then Abram leaves town at in verse four of chapter 12, when Abraham is 75, add 70 plus 75. And that's 145. Maybe some of you didn't wake up this morning wanting to do math, but that's basic math. And even I can do that. But there's a problem. There's a problem with that simple understanding, isn't it? And it's verse 32. When it tells us that Terah died when he was 205 years old. And on top of that, Acts 7 verse 4 says that Abraham didn't leave until after his father, Terah, was dead. So what's going on there? Well, I would say prob- probably what we're seeing here is Abraham is, is not the firstborn child. He probably came up to 60 years later after maybe Nahor or probably Haran. He might have not been the oldest son. Maybe even 60 years after those guys and that, of course, would, would add up the numbers to equal about 205 years old. But this, of course, brings another uncomfortable situation. Once again, in, in Acts 7, and, and keep your hand in your place there in Genesis 11, and just flip over to Acts chapter 7. Here we have Stephen in the New Testament talking about Abraham, and he says things that just make it very hard to figure out what's going on in Genesis chapter 11. 11 and 12. Um, Stephen says this in Acts 7, verse 2. He said, Hear me, brothers and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country, which you are now 
living. Appears, it, what does this appear to you? What happens here is, is God called Abraham from Ur. Now, Ur, once again, was in, in the southern area of the ancient land of Babylonia. It was like, it was like Babylonia, except south. There you go, that helps you. And it seems as though when God called Abram the first time, not only he was following God to Canaan, but his father, Terah, was as well. That's what we see in actually Genesis 11.31. Uh, Terah leads his family to Canaan, but then they all decide to stop at Haran on the way. Why? Was it because of their, their ancestral roots there? Was it because of the, the location was known for the god of the moon and maybe they wanted to, to be there again? Maybe they were giving up on the Lord and his call in their life? We do not know, but all, they do, all we know is they stop. They decide to stop midway on their journey at Haran and don't go all the way to the land of Canaan, even though we see in Genesis 11.31 that that was their intended destination. And you could think about it this way, too. Haran really wasn't on the way totally. It was halfway, but it was kind of a little bit north. They could, have, they could have gone to Canaan without going to Haran. So it seems as though God calls Abraham. He leaves, he leaves his land, his, his land of his birth in Ur, and then they all go up as a family to Haran. Then they all decide to stop there. And then Abram, of course, waits until his father dies again, or the first time. He never died twice. Uh, he, he, he waits till his father died, and then he leaves from Haran to go to Canaan. What does this mean? I'll make it very simple for you. This is what I'm absolutely convinced about. Abram was a slow mover, right? His faith was small, I would suggest to you, in the opening chapters here of Genesis in his life. He was a slow mover, but God kept calling him. God called him twice. As a matter of fact, this is not so unusual. Jesus actually did this very same thing with the disciples. He called them multiple times. Abram was a slow mover. He was perhaps stubborn. But God's plans were not frustrated by his slowness. God's pull is persistent. That's something you need to know about God. Here's another thing you need to know about the way God works. Number four, he plunders the temples. The temples he Plunders, you could say it like that if you want to keep your alliteration nice and cute. Uh, we don't get this picture of Abram as a guy who is just, you know, looking for a new home, a new family, a new country. We see a guy who is very content with where he is, seemingly, because he's so slow to make his way to Canaan. Abe wasn't looking to leave. And there's a reason for this, I would say. It's because he was content with his own gods. He was worshiping idol gods. As a matter of fact, in those days, a god was very uh, localized. You could go to one region, and that would be the presence of this god, and you could leave the presence of that god and move to another region. Remember that crazy story about Jonah and the big fish? Well, what does Jonah do? He says, I am going, because I do not want to go to Nineveh, I'm going to run away from the presence of the Lord. And we read that and we're like, you're an idiot. This guy made the universe, man. You can't run from the presence of the Lord. But, but what did the sailors do when he got on the ship? Because he, he told them, remember, he told them that he was running away from the presence of the Lord. They didn't say, you're an idiot running away from the presence of the Lord. You're like, hey, we get that all the time, buddy. Just go downstairs, uh, just kind of take a little nap while we do all the hard work in here. We'll get you away from the presence of the Lord. They're fine with it until they learn that the Lord that Jonah is running away from is the God of the land and the sea. Oh, no. You're running right into his presence, man, you idiot. Right? That was the way people thought about gods in the ancient world. You could leave one God's presence to go to a different location, and then you'd be serving a new God in that new place. Think about this. God wasn't just calling Abraham to a new land. God was calling Abraham from idols to serve and worship him alone. And that's the way God always works. He says, you leave this, leave your home, leave your kindred, leave your comforts, leave your family and follow me. And I will give you much better, much better. That's the way God always calls. We see this in Joshua 24, too, as well. Uh, Joshua says this to Israel. The God of Israel, from 
from ancient times, your father lived, your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I, Yahweh, took your father, Abraham, from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan. Notice, this is what God does. He plunders idol temples. He plun- His people are people that he has taken from false worship to worship him. That's always the way God is. And, and don't you see a big picture of who our God is and how he works? First off, he prefers paths of pain. Why? Because he wants us to listen. We are too comfortable in our sin-stained world. We need pain to arrest our attention and begin to ask questions like, why is this? And who is God? And is there a good God in all of this? He, He picks the unlikely people. Why? So that he can get the glory alone. He pulls with persistence because our sin. And our behaviors that are wrapped up in our sin are strong, and our faith is weak. And he plunders idol temples. Why? Because there is no other people than idol worshipers to pick from. Right? That's that's how God calls you. That's how God called me. He called me from serving idols of pleasure and lust and comfort to serving him and him alone. God knows your weaknesses. And he knows the perfect way to get your attention and to draw you to him. But why does he do all this? This is the final way in which he works. The final way, and I would say this is the ultimate comfort for the believer. He doesn't work the way he does simply to make me happy. He doesn't work the way he does simply to solve all of my problems. God's performance is not based on my situation, and that is greatly comfortable to me and comforting to me. Let's look at a final way in which God works, the purposes he pursues. The title is The Purposes He Pursues. The the point of Genesis is to answer very important origin questions, right? Why did God call Abraham in the first place? Let's answer that question. And why is Israel in Egypt? There's a reason. There's a reason. The answer is because God has purposes in his plan to bring himself glory through this and these problems. Uh, He has an all-wise end game in mind. Remember that? He has a perfectly wise end in mind that he is pursuing, and he has absolute wisdom and ability to pursue this wise plan. And that's why he called Abraham, because he wanted to show his wisdom. And he knew exactly the way he needed to call Abraham to show forth his wisdom. And that's why also Israel we find in Egypt as well, because God is after after a plan to show forth his wisdom. What is he trying to do? He's trying to reverse the curse. He's trying to crush the snake. And he's also trying to realize his true kingdom on earth. That is what he's trying to do. That's why he calls who he calls. And there's a bonus in all of this as well, right? We, we learn things about our God. God perfectly and wisely works to do all this and also strengthen the faith of his people. Uh, God not only is pursuing his grand kingdom goals, but he's also doing it in such a way that the faith of his people, of you and of I, of me, are strengthened. Isn't that amazing? Here's how faith grows. If you're taking notes, you want to take note of this. Faith grows this way. This is how God wants to grow your faith. This is how God grows Abraham's faith, and this is how God will also grow your faith as well. Romans 4.19 says this, And without becoming weak in the flesh, Abraham contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that God... uh, 
uh, of what God had promised, he was able also to do it. How does God grow your faith? Number one, he lets you see your weakness. That's what you see in Romans 4.19. He allows you to see your weakness. And then secondly, as you are looking at your weakness, he shows you his glory, his strength and his glory. That's what Romans 4.20 is talking about this. He grew strong in the faith, giving glory to God, by giving to glory to God. As you see your weakness, you can see God's glory and God's strength. And then that, of course, results in a strengthened faith. Romans 4.21, once again, is the definition of faith. Being fully assured that God is able to do what he has promised. That is a grown-up, strong faith. I am fully convinced that God is able to do what he has promised. One one final thing. One final thing. So we see Abram's uh, small and, and, and kind of slow faith here in the beginning. But what does Abraham's faith look like at the end? It's different. Matter of fact, Romans 4 is talking about Abram's faith at the end, when he's Abraham, doesn't it? But you remember the end. It's a famous end. It's Genesis 22. What happens in Genesis 22? How do we see Abraham's faith grow by the end of Genesis in Genesis 22? Now it happened after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And then he said, take now your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac, and go forth to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. Verse 3, so Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Now, I've always told this story this way, but I got to thinking while I was studying the life of Abraham, what if everything I thought about Genesis 22 is actually wrong? I always pictured Genesis 22 as... God talks to Abraham, Abraham, kill your son. And then the whole night, Abraham's wrestling and struggling with God. Why would you do this? Why would you give me a son only to destroy him now? I've always thought about it that way. But what if, what if that story is different? What if Abraham's faith is so strong by the point of Genesis 22 that there is no problem? in Abram's mind or in Abram's heart with giving up his son because he is fully convinced that God is able to do what he's promised. He, in his mind, he is not taking a chance at all. It's not even a calculated risk. He is convinced that God will bring his promises to pass because God has grown Abraham's faith step by step by step up to this point. He, he simply says, God is able to do what he has promised, and I trust him. Matter of fact, this is what we, we get this sense from Romans 4, and we also get this sense from Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. What would it be like to have a faith like that for you, right? What would it be like for you to have a faith that doesn't even consider that they're taking a chance following God? Any problems that come your way, you can, you can receive with Gratitude from God because you know he will fulfill his perfect plan. There is no problem in my life that my God is not bigger than and that his problems will not be faithful through. What would it be like to have a faith that didn't flinch, didn't blink, didn't question, just trusted in God? That's the kind of faith I would say God is wisely working to sanctify you towards. So that big problems in your life are not big anymore. Because God is bigger. That is the wise work of God. And that is the way God is going to work in you. And either you're going to be lacking a lot of joy in your life because you're going to be resisting that wise work. Or you're going to have an abundance of joy, an abundance of security, an abundance of hope, and an abundance of faith. And never, never be rocked by the waves of this world or of your life. 
Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this time we're able to spend in your word, and I pray that it would be helpful in instructing us in your ways and in your work. We pray that you'd make us more into the image of Christ, more steadfast, more trusting, more people of faith. Amen.